If ever a time that the tenets of this fraternity have been needed in history, it's got to be today. I really want to talk uh, tonight to those of you who are not members of this fraternity. You'll hear references to things like a trestle board, and if you don't know what that is, the trestle board is the architect's board in which he lays out the work for the day that the workmen are to carry out. And anybody who's been in the construction business knows what a trestle board is and the modern version of it. But the idea of having you men in here who are friends and not members of the craft, that's something very new. Because the old system, and by old I mean literally for centuries, right up until the most recent uh, decade, the old century was that you never asked anyone to join. Now why was it secret? I mean, my best uh, determination, at least from my background as a former professor, far as I can see, the ancient base of the Masonic uh, degree Master Mason was, in a sense, an engineering degree, so that you were either an apprentice or a journeyman or a master, and that's still true in the AFL and the trades today. We still use those designations. But you see, you didn't have the ability to chase credential. So when somebody's traveling in a foreign land and they step in and say, I'm a uh, fellow craft or I'm a master Mason, well, they need to get some proof before you let him take over charge of building either a particular arch over a doorway or a part of a building. And that's why they had these secret do guards and signs and secret words and could sit down with them and decide, had they really learned those lessons, were they really given to them? And it, that's the reason it was passed on. And I really think it was a form of credential that allowed people of the trades, particularly when cathedrals were being built all over Europe, it gave them the ability to travel and be able to prove that they were what they said they were. Because if you don't have your credential, you're dead in the water. And uh, even in modern times, that's true if you can't uh, come up with it. But that was the basis of it, and I think that's the reason for all of these old techniques. Now, the question is, why don't we get rid of them? Because I think there is a value in history and historical repetition. There was for me. And when I first started, one of my degrees, I can't remember which one, was on uh, February 22nd, Washington's birthday. But it was so important to me as a young history uh, scholar that I realized I was now going through exactly the same process as was gone through by George Washington himself at one point when he was raised and eventually became a Master Mason uh, before our American Revolution. And that was important to me to know that, that I was walking the exact same steps and using approximately the same wording and getting the same kind of learning and teaching as the founding father of our country. Now, the actual stone masons, uh, these are the people who built all those cathedrals prior to 1700. And they weren't built at one time. If you go to uh, Westminster Abbey, they'll show you the oldest part, 1069. And then every century or so, things got added. Uh, the same thing is true uh, if you get to the uh, cathedrals in any part of the world, you'll find out when these things were done. But think of all the craftsmen who created that work and their ability. And that they had formed this kind of union, if you will, a kind of guild and a kind of fraternal organization, but all of them were operative, actual stone masons. People who could take stone, shape it properly, and put it in and make it work, and structurally and architecturally it was proper. Now, what happened is, from 1700, we see the end of that period in history, and quite frankly, uh, there are no more great cathedrals being built. Men who were Freemasons, I'll tell you what they were. That meant that they were not tied by indenture or any other thing to some bishop or some cardinal or some prince or some king. They were free. They were free to offer their services to whoever was doing building. And you see, as the cathedrals start reducing in number, these people have got to get on the move to go chasing jobs in order to get uh, employment at the level that they want to be uh, paid. And those were the highest paid 
craftsmen of the time. They were the Freemasons. And as these lodges began to shrink, it was then that they finally decided with a decline in the number of craftsmen and young men were not coming in. And that's when they decided to take in and accept some men of goodwill and particularly men of status and stature, including the royalty, the people who were uh, in parliament, for example, in Britain and elsewhere uh, on the European continent. And that's why today you have the term free and accepted masons. The free and accepted now are the builders of a different kind of temple. We're not talking about building physical buildings anymore. We're talking about this temple that I'm standing in right here now in front of you and the one that you're sitting in as you sit out there in front of me. And that's not a new metaphor, that notion that this is the image of God and it is how we use it, how we share, how we give, how we love one another. When I think of all those children that the Shrine Hospitals help, that's, that's an act of God in my opinion. When I think of what's happening now with dyslexic youngsters and what Scottish Rite is doing there, including right in this building with one uh, uh, learning center and another in Madison, and there are now uh, uh, rapidly being built all over the country. What a marvelous thing for this fraternity to be able to do. And it used to do that without ever telling anyone. Well, on that basis, we became a social society and all the stonemasons' tools, whether it has to do with living by the square or on a level, you all know what a level is? Well, you live on the level. All masons are on the level when they're in a lodge. Maybe not quite all. My brother Woods was in a Masonic club in the Philippines and after the island was fairly secure, they had a visit from uh, brother Douglas MacArthur. And he gave them all a speech with his five stars up here on the collar about how in this lodge there is no rank and there are no titles. We are all brothers on the level. But my brother said nobody really went up and said, Doug, old boy, how are you? And put it on. <laughs> it is true that we do live by the square. And the square is a major tool of the stonemason. We live on the level, we hope. And we know that uh, on that trestle board is the work that's cut out for us for whatever years we've got left ahead of us. There is no religious requirement in this fraternity except one. You cannot be an atheist. And the logic of that is that if you take an oath to whoever your God is, in whatever form you hold God and your beliefs, if you have no such belief that there's any power beyond you in the world, then your oath is no good. You can change it tomorrow. That was the basis of it. And it makes good logical sense to me. But as I look at what's happening now with Muslims and Christians and Jews at each other's throat and about to engage, I think, in a major uh, problem and battle coming up, if there was ever a time that that whole concept of tolerance and diversity, and this nation embodies that concept more than any other nation on the face of the earth. Now, where did this nation get it? I'll tell you flat out, there's no question in my mind. It came out of this fraternity because you cannot separate the history of America from the history of Freemasonry in America. They are one and the same. And let me just uh, point that out to you. And by the way, it happens internationally. There have been six, in my opinion, six great true revolutions in the 17th and 18th century. What do I mean by a great and true revolution? A revolution that was not aimed at taking power. It was a revolution aimed at giving power to the people. And there were only six of those. One was obviously here in America. One was in France. One was in Italy. One was in Hungary. One was in South America. And one was in Mexico. Now who were the leaders of those six great revolutions that brought power to the common people? Obviously George Washington in this one. And in France it was Danton. In Italy, it was Garibaldi. And in South America, it was Simon Bolivar. Mexico, Juarez Benito Juarez. And in Hungary, Kashuth. All of those men, Freemasons, all of them. Is that just chance? Is that just the luck of the dice? I don't think so. The problems that we're seeing now, especially the so-called anti-Americanism, and much of it being fomented, but it's for good reason. America is no longer a place. 
In my opinion, America has become an idea. And the idea came from the craft of Freemasonry. And that idea is what's moving across the face of the globe. And if you're in power, those ideas are dangerous. And I can understand the Middle Eastern people. The ideas that are being presented in this country saying, look what happens when you let the common people move and control the government. They don't want any part of that because then they have to give up the levers of power. And this is going to take a struggle. There is no question about it. But it's starting to move worldwide and something that happened here. When I look at the key question for me, is this all chance or was it written on the trestle board? Did the supreme architect lay out the plans for the building, first of all, of this country to become the tool to bring freedom, tolerance, and love, and peaceful connection to the rest of the world? The common thread of the 13 colonies, and you need to understand that they had very little in common. And especially when you've got these southern colonies with a slave base for their power and the northern colonies not only without a slave base but anti-slavery as they grew particularly under Puritan congregational and the Presbyterian drive up north but the one thing they had in common was the craft now who carried out the war I, George Washington obviously member of the fraternity I just want you to know that Washington needed that thread because he knew that if he had his top generals and they were all fellow brother Masons, he could trust them. And he knew he had a tie to them, a cable tow to them, that was different from just commanding officer to the uh, next uh, level of rank. And the Constitutional Convention, after that successful war, when the Constitutional Convention was carried out, it almost failed. We almost didn't get that Constitution. And what saved it, and there's a dozen accounts that any of you can check that out, an 81-year-old Grand Master of the Lodge of Pennsylvania stood up and talked to them, and I'm talking about the great Benjamin Franklin. And Franklin saved that Constitutional Convention, and they finally all agreed that they would sign and worry about the, what we call the Bill of Rights at the first act of the next Congress, and they pledged those that were going to become congressmen that that would be the act one of congressman one, and it was, and they passed those first 10 amendments. I look at World War II, and for those of you uh, as our guests tonight, who are the names you associate with bringing about the successful conclusion of that war. You've got to start with Churchill and Roosevelt, no question about those two, and followed by Harry Truman, and certainly General Marshall, and the Truman or Marshall plan that followed after the war that preserved that peace. And you've got to look at Douglas MacArthur out in the Pacific and what he did in laying a constitution and creating a democracy in Japan from a nation that had been a warrior nation now, am I to tell you that most of those men are Masons? No. All of those men were Freemasons. I'm going to start going down the line. Admiral King and Admiral Leahy. I'm going down to uh, Bull Halsey. But there's no sense in going down farther ranks in either theater. The five key men, all of them members of this craft. Is that just chance? Or did they carry with them those notions that they learned from the time that they entered as an entered apprentice? Because America has a purpose and a function and a design. And I now believe it was created by the Supreme Architect with a very specific purpose. And to put it in industrial terms, we are the research and development laboratory for this world. Bring together all of the different kinds of people on the globe. Different races, different religions, different ethnic groups, different beliefs, different political beliefs. Bring everybody together and find out if they can live together peacefully and self-governed. Because if it works here, it will work for the entire globe. And that's why America has become an idea and no longer is simply a place.
But I think this current century, the one that I'm going to miss, is very promising because there's a possibility of a quantum leap to build the world's royal arch that will cover all of the peoples, all of the religions, all of the races uh, of this world to understand that we are all brothers and sisters and that we are under one fatherhood. It is possible a world of no war, of religious tolerance, of racial tolerance, with food, shelter, and security for everybody in the world, and a brotherhood of mankind. So for those of you now who are my brothers in this hall, I tell you, this is no time for any of you, regardless of your age, to say it is high 12 and there is no work before us. He has put a good deal of work on that trestle board. And let us get to our labors and finish building the temple. There's an incredible opportunity.